It permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Oh, it was, supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Welcome to the show. I'm JJ Nisiobi, standing in for Vanessa Feltz. Coming up on the programme, breaking news this afternoon, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson has been charged with historical sexual offences and has quit as the leader of the DUP. We'll have the latest on that later. Plus, Sunak's surprise honours list. The Prime Minister is under fire for inviting a businessman who donated £5 million to the Tory party just last year. And a fish a day keeps the doctor away. A new study has revealed how Brits could save the NHS up to £600 million every year with a simple portion of cod and chips. But first, let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. The leader of the DUP has quit over historic sexual offence allegations. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson wrote to the party chairman, stepping down with immediate effect. All his social media accounts have been deleted. He will appear in court next month alongside a woman who's also been charged with aiding and abetting in connection with the alleged offences. Gavin Robinson has been appointed as the interim party leader. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has sparked an Easter honours row for giving a major Tory donor a knighthood. Mohammed Mansour, a businessman and a senior treasurer for the party, was honoured for his business, charity and political service. Last year, he gave £5 million, which is one of the biggest donations to the Conservatives in decades. Meanwhile, pressure is mounting on Labour's Angela Rayner in the ongoing tax route over the sale of her council house. The deputy Labour leader says she's confident she hasn't broken any rules. Party chair Annalise Dodds agrees. I've got complete confidence in her and you know really i think we need to ask the question why are we seeing this petty politicking coming from the conservatives you know i know that rather than talking about the finances of one individual many people watching this will be saying well hang on why aren't politicians talking about family finances Actor Sally Phillips has spoken out after her son with Down syndrome was excluded from playing at a trampoline park. The Miranda and Bridget Jones star says she wasn't allowed in with Ollie, who's 19, unless she had a letter from his GP. Phillips says people like her son are being singled out for being different and that was upsetting and unbearable. The company said it was deeply sorry, but it was following the safety guidance from British Gymnastics. Motorists have been warned to avoid using the motorway between 11 and 2 tomorrow and Sunday. That's when traffic will be the heaviest. More than 14 million trips are expected to take place this bank holiday weekend. At least three major airports say they're expecting this to be their busiest Easter weekend on record. Well, Heathrow can expect some serious disruption in two weeks' time, with Border Force workers announcing they're going on strike. 600 officials responsible for carrying out immigration controls and passport checks will walk off the job from the 11th of April. They're angry about a new roster, which they say could lead to the loss of hundreds of jobs. We're not expecting to see Kate Middleton this Easter while she's being treated for cancer. But King Charles is expected to make an appearance at Windsor Castle's Easter Sunday service. Royal commentator Michael Cole told Talk Today it's hugely important to him. It means a lot to him. He is a man of faith, um, and Easter is arguably a more significant and more important date in the Christian calendar, even than Christmas. Uh, and he's determined to be there, and the Queen will be there with him. Soldiers might be seen with full facial hair. The army has lifted a ban on serving soldiers having beards after years of discussion around its facial hair policy. However, the beards and moustaches must be well-groomed and neat, and they will be routinely checked. That's your news. Now here's your weather with Isabel Lang. <laughs>
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello again. There will be some tricky driving conditions today because of the weather. Again, heavy showers and thunderstorms, some hail thrown in as well. You can just see the showery nature of the weather. There will be some gaps in between the showers there with a little bit of sunshine. But I think for many, it's just one of those days, really. Lots of showers, particularly heavy this afternoon through northern parts of England and up into Scotland, Northern Ireland as well. It could well just turn a bit drier across more southern areas to end the day, thankfully. And temperatures will reach around 12 or 13 degrees, a little bit up on yesterday's not as windy either. Now, as we head through this evening and tonight, well, there will be some drier conditions developing across many central and eastern parts of England and Wales. Still for Scotland and Northern Ireland, some showers. But uh, under the clearer skies here, it will turn a little chilly, the odd pocket of frost. And I think we'll see some mist and fog forming later in the night as well. So temperatures in towns and cities holding up near a five or six degrees, but still a bit chilly. Out there first thing in the morning, though, quite optimistic for some sunshine. I think the showers on Saturday are more likely to be across Scotland and Northern Ireland, where it will be quite uh, breezy, but elsewhere, nice in the sunshine that's for sure and uh, it could well be that we see temperatures climbing to 12 to maybe even 14 or 15 mid-afternoon. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, thank you to Nadira and Isabel. Let's move on to our top story now. So Geoffrey Donaldson has stepped down as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party with immediate effect after he was charged with historical sexual offences. A 57-year-old woman has also been charged with aiding in connection with the alleged offences. Talk TV's chief political commentator, Peter Cardwell, joins me now. Peter, so what exactly has, has he been charged with, Donaldson? So these are historic sexual offences. Um, we don't know when they happen. We don't know who his accusers are. But we know that he will appear in court next month on the 24th, along with his co-accused, who is a 57-year-old woman. These proceedings are, of course, active. He has been charged. So that's about as much as we can say about them. But certainly, politically, this is hugely significant in Northern Ireland. He is the leader of the largest unionist party, or was at least until earlier today, when that shock statement came through that Sir Geoffrey Donaldson had resigned as leader of the Democratic Unionists. He's still an MP. He's been an MP since 1990 and uh, indeed the longest serving MP in Northern Ireland. He has had uh, ties cut with the DUP, he's suspended from them, as is the case if, he's, if you're accused of a serious crime. So that is what has happened. And they have an interim leader who's another member of parliament, a man called Gavin Robinson. And what does this mean long term for the DUP? Of course, we've got a temporary leader, but uh, with Donaldson gone, are we, are we going to see a, an, uh, some kind of election taking place or will they just decide quietly themselves who's going to lead them? Yeah, they'll have to have a leadership election. Now, in the last couple of years, they've been very tumultuous times. The DUP, there was another leader, Edwin Poots, for a very short period of time, literally about three weeks, and then Geoffrey Donaldson took over. It's a very divided party, and there have been all sorts of arguments in regard to the Windsor framework, in regard to the future of the DUP's rule within the mandatory coalition, the executive in Northern Ireland, essentially the cabinet, which is a coalition of uh, four different parties, uh, including the DUP and Sinn Féin, and actually the Sinn Féin leader, uh, in Northern Ireland anyway, the First Minister of Northern Ireland, Michelle O'Neill, has within the last hour actually responded to this. A very uh, short statement where she says, Mrs Michelle O'Neill, the First Minister, who is also Northern Ireland leader of Sinn Féin, my priority is to continue to provide the leadership the public expect and deserve, Michelle O'Neill says, and to ensure the four-party executive coalition delivers for the whole of our community now and in the future. The DUP leader has resigned after being charged with serious offences. This is now a matter for the criminal justice system. That's what she says, but certainly the fragile nature of the four-party coalition in Northern Ireland will come under the microscope in the days and weeks to come. Yeah, so what does this mean for the, uh, the, the wider implication of politics in Northern Ireland and the stability of the region? How is this going to be affected? Certainly, well, Geoffrey Donaldson wasn't a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly. He was previously, and in fact, he was a minister there. But he had decided to stay as leader of the DUP and indeed an MP at Westminster. And under recent legislation, he can't be a member of both the Northern Ireland Assembly and the uh, Westminster Parliament. So in a slightly weird thing, he ran for the Northern Ireland Assembly. He won a seat there and then immediately gave up that seat and gave it to a woman called Emma Little Pengelly, who is now the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. So she actually wasn't elected on that occasion anyway uh, within his constituency. So 
she will continue as Deputy First Minister. Michelle O'Neill from Sinn Féin will continue as First Minister. But certainly it has been quite fragile. Obviously, there was a two-year period when Sinn Féin and the DUP were not in government together. The DUP were refusing to go in because, well, many factors, but certainly they were talking about the uh, post-Brexit arrangements, the protocol, the Windsor framework, which was voted through the House of Commons just over a year ago. So I think there are many questions now in terms of how Northern Ireland's politics goes forward. Uh, Geoffrey Donaldson, absolutely huge, towering figure, been in politics in Northern Ireland for over 40 years, originally with the Ulster Unionist Party. He then left that uh, under very, very fractious circumstances after the Belfast Agreement. And somewhat ironically, it was Good Friday exactly 26 years ago when he walked out of those, uh, at, the ver at the very last moment, those uh, negotiations for the Belfast Agreement and has subsequently uh, joined the DUP and now, Good Friday 2024, he, his uh, political career is in tatters and he has been charged with very serious offences. All right, Peter Cardwell, thank you very much. Uh, moving on now. Rishi Sunak has sparked an honours row after he announced a knighthood for one of the Conservative Party's biggest donors. Last night, the Prime Minister awarded Mohammed Mansour for his contributions to business, charity and political service. He donated £5 million to the Tories just last year. Also on the list were four Tory MPs who have been loyal to Sunak, including Philip Davies, the husband of Cabinet Minister Esther McVeigh. Joining me in the studio now is former advisor to Michael Gove, Charlie Rowley, and Time and Radio presenter Adam Bolton. And down the line, political commentator Mike Buckley. Um, actually, Mike, I'll start with you. This just seems to me like business as usual for our dodgy politicians, no? Uh, to a degree, well, this is a strange time of year to produce uh, an honours list. So this, they normally happen at the King's birthday, which is in June, or the official birthday, or at New Year. So this is an odd time to be putting out uh, a list of new appointments. So that is raising speculation that Rishi Sunak is planning to go for a summer election. I, I doubt very much that's the reason. I suspect he simply wants to do something to shore up his position in the Conservative Party and making four MPs, you know, giving them... Um, an honour is a good thing, and it may be this person who's given him five million last year. It may be uh, an attempt to get him to give the Conservative Party more money, because obviously the general election is coming at some point this year, and it may be that Rishi Sunak has decided, you know what, we could do with getting some more money in the coffers, and this is one way to make this person, uh, you know, maybe give us some more money, or maybe indicate to other people that they should give us a donation as well, because then they could be, you could be indicating if you do that, you might get an honour in the future. I mean, it does raise questions, of course again, about the integrity of the honour system, because I don't know, I, can't, I don't have any specific allegations on Mohammed Mansour, but this is a person who held uh, positions of authority, for example, in Hosni Mubarak's government in Egypt, which was seen as very authoritarian. So I think there is a question of, you know, is this person the right person to be part of the UK government or the UK uh, parliamentary system? Adam, this just... I, I, I want to call it dodgy, but as I say, this is just politics, isn't it? People pay money, people get rewarded for for paying more money. Well, I was talking to uh, an Oxford professor, a Cambridge professor earlier on, professor of law, who's done a report into the honour system, and he just openly used the word corruption. He just said, this, this is institutionalised corruption, that mm. for political favours, we now give people honours. And actually, we've had handles of handouts of honours to MPs at random times before. We're having them increasingly now. And, and even if you want to be really cynical, uh, you can say that to Mr Mansur, the man who donated the five... Uh, Oh, sorry, Sir Mansur, <laughs> who donated the five billion, has actually, a million, has now sold himself rather cheap because uh, working it out, it appeared that three million and above and you've got a peerage. Now, it may be <laughs> because he's been a minister in the Egyptian government, uh, they perhaps thought that giving him a peerage like... Uh, uh, Mr. Lebedev, for example, well, my, uh, Lord Lebedev, sorry, might be going too far. <laughs> but I, I, I just do think the whole thing now is transparently corrupt, if, mm -hmm. if, if, if that's not an oxymoron, you know. Yeah. And, and this is the way business is done. And likewise, you know, if you look at the MPs, including incidentally one of the DUP who've been, who've been given honours this time round, it's more or less an award for loyalty. Um, Frankly, I think only Tracy Crouch on that list would be described as someone who's given exceptional service. The others have uh, stuck around and now they've uh, got their rewards. Yes, yeah, so Charlie, we've got rich people giving money to the Tory party. And we've got 97 Tory MPs now uh, with knighthoods. This is a completely corrupt system, but you're going to defend it, I'm sure. 
Well, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of talent on the show. So <laughs> yes, yeah. I could be in the laws by the end of how this interview goes myself. Um, I mean, I don't have five million. I don't even have five quid. Let's go five million. So um, I'll rule that one out. But look, there's a lot of talent on the Conservative backbenches. I mean, just picking up what, what Mike said, look, you know, um, in terms of the birthdays, honours and the New Year's honours, you know, let's um, uh, be able about it. You know, the birthday of the uh, monarch would have changed, so there might be a new... Uh, date for the uh, birthday on this and the Prime Minister uh, may, if he has a, an election called before the new year, um, if there's a change of government, he won't be able to. They have a resignation on as this, though. He'll have a resignation on us, yeah. and, and, and there'll be uh, plenty of other good, yeah. you know, uh, politicians that I'm sure are rewarded for good service on that one as well. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think um, I, I wouldn't read too much into it. I think... You it's, wouldn't read too much into it. Well, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that um, because you've given uh, a one peerage to... Uh, one honour to this donor, that all the others were there for just to try and fluff it up and to try and you know, uh, diminish uh, that particular honour. He was uh, uh, awarded for good uh, service to charity uh, as well, including the King's Fund. So there's more to it than just pure politics. But um, <laughs> but I think, um, uh, as I say, to dress it up as just a, a, a way in giving him an honour, you've got to give it to other people, like Christopher Nolan, the director of uh, uh, Oppenheimer, a great film, yeah. um, I'm told. Um, uh, and, <laughs> go on, Adam. And the head, and the head of uh, AI, um, mm. uh, who's gone deep mind as, uh, as yeah. well. I, I, there is a technical reason, I am told, constitutional reason, why this list has come out now. And it is to do with inducing the former First Minister of Wales, Mr Drakeford, and uh, the leader of the SNP at Westminster into the Privy Council. And apparently, when you promote people in the Privy Council, that is a time when you quite often have an honours list. You know, the next people in the pipeline uh, get it, but you know. Ah. But he, he, soon I announced it just before the Easter break at 5:30 p.m. when all of us good journalists are down the pub. So it, I feel like he's really snuck this in so he can try and avoid the scrutiny, but he's not avo evaded us, has he? Well, arguably, it's a, it uh, would be another demonstration of him not knowing a lot, great deal about politics, because uh, to uh, make an announcement like this on a bank holiday weekend when there isn't any other political news <laughs> activity going on just about guarantees it will get the sort of uh, in-depth attention which we're giving it. Indeed. Well, I, I think it shows that the Prime Minister works um, until the very last minute of the very end of the working <laughs> day. And uh, just as he did when he announced um, uh, the, um, uh, the it sort of a speech to the nation at 6pm a couple of Fridays ago yeah. about extremism in the country and sort of the kind of language that's mm. being used, you know, uh, that was a Friday of at course, 6 o'clock. Friday is resignation day, uh, uh, yes. of course, yes. and, and the Donaldson fits into that, certainly. Yeah. Um, Michael, coming back to you. I have questions about the fact that Mon uh, Mr. Mansour, Sir Mansour, was even involved with the Tory party at all. As we said, he worked for a dictator. There's no question about that. He was investigated for tax evasion and had to settle a huge bill from one of his companies. Uh, and there's another thing that... He, but either way, the, the guy was made... He, I would say he has a sketchy past, and yet he was made treasurer of, of the Tory party. Why are the, the Tories so happy to take money from people who have questionable histories? Well, it comes across as deep arrogance, doesn't it? I mean, you would think a, a party, any political party, a long way behind in the polls for a consistent period of time like this one, you would think they would be doing everything possible to try and convince the public that they're a serious party of government, that they have the nation's best interests at heart, that they have some kind of ethical code and morality. And giving somebody with this person's background a, a, a knighthood just that indicates the exact opposite. And indeed, making him treasurer of the Conservative Party indicates the exact opposite. The fact that, as you say, he absolutely did work for a dictator does not say to us this is somebody who is committed to democracy, who is therefore committed to British values, and who has the best interests of the people of the UK at heart. So it, it may not be that there's something particularly awful going on, but what it says to the country is that either the Conservative Party just doesn't care what we think about them anymore, or it says that they just simply don't understand how bad this looks to the general public and how bad this looks particularly to a country that's been going through a cost of living for a long time, in large part because of um, bad choices made by this government. And that therefore we're worried about money. And this person clearly has lots of money, he's given it to the Conservative Party and he's getting, you know, he's getting what looks like a reward that he really isn't due. Yeah, Charlie, Sermon Saw also carried on trading in Russia after Russia invaded Ukraine. I believe his company stopped trading there after there was pressure put, put upon them. But this does not seem like the kind of character we should be bestowing such an honour on. Well, I think on the first point, I mean, you, you, you can sanction Russia, and obviously as we should, and the UK has, but um, you can't 
blame uh, uh, the Russian people and Russian business on what actions are taking place by the Russian government. So you've got to separate that out, I think, a little bit. The second point that Mike was sort of touching on, I mean, no one's asked him to run a public institution. No one's asked him to come into public service. He's, it's an internal appointment being treasurer of the Conservative Party. And for mm. someone who is a, uh, for whatever uh, uh, history he may have in terms of business, and he might have had debts to pay, I'm sure they've been paid off. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that he's a bad businessman. I mean, you, Donald Trump has had, you know, tr uh, debts to pay and sort of you know, liquidation in his, his companies, but nobody would say that he was a bad businessman. So I think the well, fact that he was will, a, but, uh, 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 I, I think the fact that, you know, uh, Mr. Missouri has been a Tory party treasurer to manage the internal finances. No one's calling party. him a bad businessman, mm. but tax evasion, that's not very honest. No, you, but you can say about this, if, if you want to be really cynical, you can say this is so blatant and so transactional mm. that that is actually the point that the taxpayer doesn't want to pay for political parties. Therefore, if you have a system where, you know, somewhat shady people cough up large amounts of money and then their name is whitewashed by being given the title, I mean, you can say fair is fair, I don't want to pay for the Tory party or indeed the Labour Party or the Liberal Democrat mm. Party. So, so do we just accept this corruption as the way of financing our political system? Right, well, reform. Let's move on to them. They are beating uh, the Tories in working class areas. It doesn't really surprise me, to be honest. I I'm a working class boy from a working class area. We would sooner vote for reform than vote for the Tories. But should the Tories be bothered about this? Is this, is this going to scare them? Well, I think, look, um, there were some comments that were made by um, uh, Danny Kruger, MP, who's the chair of the, the new Conservative group, I think it's uh, labelled, um, who was praising, uh, to an extent, um, reform for some of their policies and the way in which they uh, are going about their business and, you know, criticising internally that he thought the Conservative Party wasn't Conservative enough. I don't personally take that view. Um, uh, I do um, uh, worry about the polls, obviously. I think every Conservative should be worried about the polls. You can't ignore them. But I do think as you get close to a general election, you know, those polls will narrow. I think when you see more scrutiny uh, within the Labour Party, so uh, issues like uh, Angela Rayner, issues like, you know, <laughs> childcare, issues like, you know, how are they actually going to manage the public finances? Are taxes going to go up or are they going to come? You know, Labour need to be in that election very clear about what they're going to do. And I think when the public are faced with the choice, because they're not faced with it at the minute, it might not come until the end of the year, but when they are faced with that choice, I think um, you'll start to see those polls narrow. People will be very, very, you know, of the understanding that there's only going to be one bloke that's going to be Prime Minister. It's either going to be Rishi Sunak or Sakir Starmer. So why uh, flirt with reform? Adam, is there any point with reform? They're not going to win any seats, are they? Well, yeah, I mean, they may well do what the Liberals used to do, have a decent vote across the country and no seats. It looks extremely unlikely they're going to get any seats. But the point about reform is that it is a stalking horse for the Conservative Party, that the people involved, you know, like Nigel Farage, but also those sympathetic to it within the Tory party, like Jacob Rees-Mogg and some others, uh, simply want to pull the Conservative Party in their direction by saying, look, uh, we can get more votes if you come over to us. And, and there was this agreement in the last election that they didn't stand against Conservatives this time around. They are, say they are going to stand against Conservatives. So this is about an ongoing battle within the Conservative Party. And my analysis is actually that the people who want to move in the reform direction, including Kruger and the new Conservatives, are currently calculating that they're going to be stronger politically now than they will be after the election. And so they're putting the pressure on now. But the real point about all this is what reform is not doing is beating the Labour Party. Yeah. And yeah. in working class areas. Yeah. And that is where the election is going to be decided. If those working class voters that went over to uh, Boris Johnson uh, actually go back to Labour and all the evidence is just look at the opinion polls that they are. Farage has suggested that, the, that reform could merge with the Tories. Do we see that happening? Well, um, <laughs> Nigel Farage might suggest that, but I don't think uh, any Conservative is, is, is suggesting that. You know, seriously, at the, at the, you know, the heights of the Conservative Party, I don't think anyone is suggesting that. Well, you know, he, he was at the, at the Manchester Party conference. He was fated by people like Priti Patel. Prime Minister has said he'd be welcome in the party, even although he's consistently stood against the party. So, yeah, I think there's an element who are, if you like, running scared of the reform group. And we had that famous... Um, opinion poll produced by Lord Frost, uh, David Frost, uh, suggesting that the party was on course for wipeout, unless, guess what, it changed its policies to agree with Lord Frost. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I would make a prediction. I think Nigel Farage will die a member of the Conservative Party. 
Oh, okay. Hopefully not soon. Uh, Mike Buckley. <laughs> uh, Lee Anderson is the only sitting uh, reform MP. Oh, oh, though actually, let me point out, he was supposed to go on the uh, the Suns show, uh, never mind the, the ballots, and he bottled it. So I'm not sure what he feels about reform now, but what do you think about reform? Do you think we could see more Tories defecting? I'd be very surprised because, as you say, they're very unlikely to win any seats in the next election. I mean, obviously, we're going to see a lot of, if, you know, if the polls are anywhere near true, which I think they are, um, based on my engagement with voters, we are going to see a lot of Conservative MPs lose their seats to Labour at the next general election. But if any Conservative MP wants to stay an MP after the next general election, they'll be far more sensible to stay a member of the Conservative Party, which has a long track record of winning seats, than join reform. And you mentioned the poll showing that uh, reforms ahead of the Conservatives and working class areas. I mean, I think it's important to say this is one poll reform will one point ahead, which is within the margin of error. So, and this is only in some parts of the country as well. So I think it's, it's you can't say across the board, yes, reform are doing really well amongst working class people, you know, much, much better than Conservatives. But obviously this is something that should worry the Conservatives. And they obviously need to do more to appeal to working class people and to offer something to them, just as the same, they, same as they do to middle class people or, or anybody else in the country. But I think the other important point about reform is that they've in recent months been polling relatively high, but actually when it comes to an actual by-election or something where people actually go and vote, uh, their vote tends to drop off entirely. They did a bit better in the Wellingborough by-election quite recently and in Kingswood, but in previous by-elections, they've been polling say 12, 13%, and on the day they've got maybe three or 4%. So that may be giving the Conservatives some cause for not complacency, but confidence, but of course, I mean, Adam's completely right. The big battle in the end is going to be between the Conservatives and Labour. And right now, Labour is smashing it. Yeah, well, I think, I think the Tories did win over the working class with their plans for levelling up, but levelling up never actually happened. Uh, thank you to Mike Buckley and Charlie Rowley. Adam Bolton is staying with me. That sounds very sinister, doesn't it? Adam Bolton is staying with me. Coming up after the break, for the first time ever, members of the British Army will be allowed to keep their beards. So, will this solve the recruitment crisis? You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. A hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry-on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missing! <laughs> there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Hey, was to it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Soldiers and officers are now allowed to grow beards while serving in the British Army. The century-old policy has been updated following approval from the King after, uh, after a review showed the vast majority of servicemen and women wanted it changed. Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has previously urged the Army to modernise, saying the rule is ridiculous. But it won't be a hippie beard free-for-all. Soldiers will be routinely checked to make sure they are properly groomed and neat. As questions are raised about defence spending with war raging in Europe and across the globe, will this fix the armed forces recruitment crisis? Still with me here in the studio is Times Radio presenter Adam Bolton and down the line, former army officer Stuart Crawford. Uh, Stuart, first of all, I didn't even know that this was a thing. I didn't know you, you weren't allowed facial hair in the army. Well, yes, I mean, that is that is the case, um, although not historically, but uh, in, in recent times, uh, beards uh, have been not have not been permitted in the army, apart from certain exceptions. Pioneer sergeants, for for example, uh, and of course the um, special forces uh, like to sport beards because it makes them different from the the rest of the the body of the Kirk, if you like. But historically, beards have been part and parcel of British army service for hundreds of years, and and indeed in the First World War, although there were no beards, uh, moustaches were compulsory. Uh, up until 1916. So it's a, it's a sort of military fashion trend, and it just so happens that the, the military and the armed services tend to be about 20 years behind uh, the rest of society when it comes to such trends. And so with 52% or whatever it is of the male population in the UK now sporting facial hair, the army is just catching up. Yeah, look, Stuart, if I'm completely honest, the only reason I'm not in the army is because I have a beard. So now I can finally sign up and join. <laughs> but for everyone else, do you think it's going to make any real difference? Well, I think that um, in, in terms of the attractiveness of the offer, it will make a slight difference uh, for those who might have been put off uh, by the fact that they couldn't have a beard uh, in the army, although you can in the Navy and the Air Force, and also perhaps for various ethnic minorities who uh, sport beards as part of their cultural uh, or religious um, uh, heritage, inheritance. But, uh, I mean, strictly speaking, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact. Uh, and, but it does remove uh, one of the excuses from Capita, the company to which the army has outsourced its recruiting, that they can't uh, meet the remit that they've been set. Hmm. Adam, this isn't going to make a blind bit of difference, is it? I think it might make a slight bit of difference because, really? well, I, I'm not a beard person, you are. People <laughs> feel very strongly about their beards, and I can imagine there's some people who are saying, Well, mine hides my ugly face, that's why I keep yeah, it. Yeah, some say I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't join if I had to give up my beard. Just like we know tattoos, for example, are an issue now where the army appears to want to uh, liberalise its attitude toward, towards visible tattoos. And, you know, they do have a problem with the Capita Recruitment Service and the fact that even once people apply, 50% of it withdraw their application because it's taking over a year to process them. So, you know, according to Grant Shapps, who supports this measure, we are in a pre-war phase. Therefore, it seems sensible to broaden the pool as possible. And I have to say the women uh, serving uh, members of the military who are supporting this are being uh, very generous because, of course, it doesn't apply to them. <laughs> uh, but again, uh, we understand from surveys that... Uh, Young women and the people who will be serving the army actually quite like beards on men anyway, so maybe that's the reason. Uh, maybe. But one of the things, one of, one of my issues with the army and their recruitment is that they target the poorest areas uh, of the country. They're not going to the wealthy areas where the rich kids live. They're going to the poorest areas where kids have less opportunities. I think that is part of the problem with their recruitment rather than beards being the big issue. Well, 
Uh, to a point, but of course the army or, or the Ministry of Defence has withdrawn funding for the CCF forces at private schools. So in that sense, they're not going there. And likewise, there have been cutbacks in the university scholarship. So yeah, you could say this is a, a you know, say you can grow a beard is a cheaper than saying we'll pay for your university <laughs> education. Mm. Uh, so I think that you, you know, I think there may be a certain amount of truth in that. Um, but I, I, I do think it's it's a realization of. Uh, where the public is, that you know, the army wants to reflect the public as a whole, and a lot of you have got beards. <laughs> Stuart, aside from uh, letting people grow their hippie beards, how else can the army realistically increase their recruitment? Well, I just have uh, a comment uh, just uh, on what's just been discussed. I would say that sadly, unemployment and poverty have always been the recruiter's friend. Uh, and that is something uh, that seems to have been as with, uh, with us for centuries. However, uh, other ways that we can make the offer more attractive uh, would be uh, better paying conditions. Not so much pay as conditions of service. Uh, there's been a lot of publicity about the appalling condition of some uh, service accommodation, uh, which again has, uh, like recruiting, has been outsourced and has been found wanting. And also, I think a little bit more cognizance of the requirements of spouses and families uh, would go a long way to uh, help uh, the, the recruitment offer. But in the final analysis, uh, the army is not seen as a, an expanding and confident and buoyant organization. And people tend not to, or, uh, to, to join organizations which are, being, are seen as being on a downward spiral. I do think there is a serious point though that having rules on presentation is important because you do need military discipline and just defining it is very important. I mean, I remember you're, you're far too young, but there was a great <laughs> outcry a few years ago where the Germans in their army said men could wear hairnets. And uh, this you know, made tabloid headlines over here because people said, how can you possibly have men wearing hairnets? It's, it's so effeminate, it's not what we expect of the armed forces. And, and, and therefore, how you stipulate how people look is still important. Yeah. And, and the one thing that I do wonder about, having you know, briefly been in war zones with, with, with military, is you always have to do drills for putting on gas masks and all mm. that. And there are people who say that, that beards don't work with gas masks. And, and uh, wow. so presumably people who are in zones where they might be subject to gas attack, will be advised to shave, I don't know. Yeah, perhaps, that's a good point. Well, thank you, Adam Bolton, and thank you to Stuart Crawford. Coming up after the break, could you help the NHS's spending crisis simply by eating an extra portion of fish each week? Find out exactly what I'm talking about next. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. It's Good Friday, traditionally a day where fish is on the menu. And now research suggests we should be having much more of it in order to boost the nation's health and our economy. A study estimates that if everyone ate one more portion of fish a week, the NHS could save up to 600 million quid a year by preventing thousands of types of cancer and type 2 diabetes cases. It could also save businesses up to 360 million pounds annually in reduced sick leave. Fish are good sources of protein and vitamins, minerals and fatty acids, which all help maintain a healthy weight. Uh, it can also lower cholesterol and blood pressure, but current estimates suggest people are only eating half of what they really should, uh, with younger people especially eating the least. As the NHS faces an unprecedented crisis, could this help free up some much needed funds? Joining me now is dietitian Dwayne Meller and former chair of the BMA GP committee, Dr. Lawrence Buckman. Uh, Dwayne, let me start with you first as a, as a resident dietitian. Um, what is it about fish and, and also fried fish? Because surely we should be saying to people, yeah, eat fish, but actually not from a chip shop. I think there's a few conflating things here. This is a report funded by Sea Fish, the organisation that the government tries to get us eating more fish. And it's looked at what people have eaten and then predicted their risk or estimated their risk of disease later and then use that to do the maths. And that's been conflated as it's got through the news cycle into being fried fish because that's linked to Good Friday. It's a good news story. This is about eating you know, white fish or oily fish you know, one portion of each twice a week, you know, so you can two portions a week, and that's the aim that's been linked, and that's been put into the maths for the equations to actually estimate this reduction in risk. So it's not about having fish and chips, it's about eating fish as white fish, steam fish, or tin fish, such as pilchards in tomato sauce, and not about eating your sort of fish and chips type meal. Oh, so it's a bit more sinister than, they, than, than, than they've let on. It's all a big marketing ploy is what you're saying. It's not a marketing ploy. <laughs> Eating fish is good, but it's what we need to think about is when people eat fish, they tend to be having a healthier diet. It may be associated with other factors such as socioeconomic factors. You know, if you're eating sort of a grilled piece of fish, you like to have it with vegetables, where if you're having a pie, you might be having that with chips. So it's thinking what it goes with and what it's taking out of someone's diet rather than saying fish is brilliant. You, know, you can do similar things with lentils. You can do similar things with other healthy food. It's about a whole diet pattern. And we need to be not misled in thinking one food solves the whole diet's issues. Right, Dr. Lawrence, um, these claims that, that are being made that eating fish once a week is going to prevent cancer and diabetes, is there truth in that? There's statistical truth in it, but as has been said, it's been bigged up to, uh, to describe... Uh, what would happen if every single person in Britain ate two portions of fish, as we've already said, not necessarily fried fish, two portions of baked fish uh, a week would make a significant difference, but it wouldn't be £600 million. What it's doing is reducing the risk of, the risk of diabetes deteriorating or getting diabetes in the first place, and particularly bowel cancer um, 
uh, is associated with not eating uh, essential fatty acids. So it's actually better for you to eat two portions of fish. But to turn that into 600 million pounds, mm, I'm not so sure. <laughs> well, uh, 600 million quid extra a year for the NHS, definitely money that, that we could do with. But is, is, is this ever going to be solved? All we keep hearing about is obesity levels are rising. We talk about it all the time. The public know if you eat bad food, you get fatter. If you don't exercise, you're going to put on weight. And yet nothing seems to change. Right. Well, <clears throat> uh, the only way you can get people to eat more sensibly, I think, sadly, uh, is to make it more expensive for them to eat things that are unhealthy. And uh, I certainly would support a sugar tax. It's not just sugar, of course. Uh, it's fried food, excessive amounts of meat and meat fat. You need to re-educate diets. And the way you do that is probably through people's wallets. You don't have to raise the price very high. You just have to make it slightly less attractive. For example, why do we consume full sugar drinks when we could consume diet drinks? We could do that. Even that, which is not then many diet drinks are not particularly healthy for you. But certainly if they haven't got sugar in, the obesity epidemic would be less because one of the commonest things that people drink are fizzy sugary drinks. OK, uh, Duane, lots of people don't like fish. Uh, it's, I don't find it that filling particularly. I'd have to have two cods for, one, uh, for, for my one meal to feel full up. Other people think that fish stinks, it makes your house stink. So if you're not going to eat fish, what would you advise? To... <laughs> Dr. Dwayne shaking his head. If we're not going to eat fish, what would you advise we have instead? So, yeah, we need to remember that things like pulses, you know, if you're looking at cost, they take a little bit of work to get used to. But if you look at your, your fish and you need two portions, have one portion and serve it on a, a bed of lentils, then you get the benefit of the fibre and the protein in the lentils. You can also use nuts and seeds to get some of the essential fatty acids. And we need to remember, although we talk about these omega-3, these healthy fats to get in fish, they get them ultimately from eating other things like algae. So we can include things like seaweed in our diet. So, you know, you know, a healthy sushi could be an option as well. And that also gives you the iodine, which is the other thing we don't talk about with fish. You know, the British diet is quite low in this, this mineral iodine, and that's linked to brain function as well as our metabolic rate. So we need to encourage people to eat good sources of iodine. We get some from dairy, but most of it comes from sea and sort of from the, this, this, the uh, minerals in the water in the sea, which, you know, things like seaweed take up and they eventually end up in fish. So we can, what we call, eat down the food chain a little bit and we can get a healthy diet that way. Well, Dr. Lawrence suggested uh, about the sugar tax. And one of the things I often hear people say is that, oh, eating healthy is too expensive. But actually, fruit and veg is really very, very, very cheap. Is it not more a case of people are just lacking discipline? So I think there's a few things there. You know, we've closed children's centres, which did a lot of great work <laughs> getting families to cook and try new foods, because the risk of trying new foods and wasting is one of the problems that we hear. And learning how to cook things that are quick, easy, and don't sort of evolve two hours of washing up afterwards. So the, they need to re-educate. Then we need to look at marketing, and we need to break the marketing that makes the unhealthy foods look attractive and use that tool to make healthier foods more attractive, as well as possibly some of these levers, these levies, so you can make unhealthy food more expensive, but make healthy food more accessible and sort of better value, and that makes it more attractive. And then we need to start talking about it in an exciting way. You know, no one talks about sort of vegetables being exciting and cool. Everyone talks about unhealthy food being exciting, and it's marketing that way. So we need to make, you know, Vegetables sexy again. That's the answer. We need to make things fun. <laughs> make vegetables sexy again. That's a great slogan. Uh, thank you very much, Dwayne Muller and Dr. Lawrence Buckman, for your time there. Coming up after the break, pressure is mounting on the US rapper and music producer P. Diddy as he faces multiple lawsuits alleging crimes from human trafficking to sex abuse. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eave it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. It's a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite right Yay. too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Pressure is mounting on Sean Diddy Coombe, one of the most successful music moguls in the history of rap, after a string of lawsuits have been filed against him, alleging a series of crimes from sexual assault to human trafficking. American authorities raided two of his properties earlier this week, even putting his sons in handcuffs at one point, although no arrests were made. Joining me now is showbiz journalist Rebecca Toomey for more on this story. Good afternoon, Rebecca. Uh, Hi, Jake. Just get us up to date, get us up to speed with, with Diddy. Well, this, here's what I know already. Uh, two of his mansions were raided. Uh, and what are the allegations against him? He's had multiple allegations of sex trafficking um, at the moment. And then this morning they found firearms at one of the properties. They've seized mobile phones. Um, he's actually just been um, snapped this afternoon with um, two of his daughters in Miami because there was speculation that he'd fled the US, but we've obviously just seen a uh, confirmed sighting of P. Diddy. At the moment, though, he's battling multiple lawsuits. And as each day creeps on, more and more information and allegations are sort of surfacing. But what's really gained momentum, JJ, is that there's uh, the latest legal situation um, is a 75 page doc by page document, which is from one of the male producers he's been working with for a year. And what's happened in this is that I think the reason it's getting so much attention is some of the names that have been listed. Prince Harry um, was named as someone, and now 50 Cent, um, another huge music star, his ex-girlfriend, Daphne Joy, has been named. Um, there were claims that she was actually being paid as a sex worker by Diddy. Now, she's denied this, but the problem is, is that more and more people are getting dragged into this, and there's some big names going on. Because what's at the sort of centre of all of this is that this is um, allegations and there have been rumours of this for several years where P Diddy was effectively hosting with claims of, which, all of which he's denied, but that the claims that he was hosting these big parties with lots of sex workers and also um, there's accusations that he was sex trafficking women and some people were saying that he was forcing them into sex acts and drugging them. So it's a very, very dark story and I think this is just going, we're going to keep getting tiny bits of information as we go forward and as this investigation continues. But at this moment, it just does not look good for P Diddy at all. So you say these rumours have been swirling around Diddy for years. Uh, yes. 
and he's been tied to some big names, including Prince Harry and Prince William. But then why was he given the, the key to New York City just last year? I, I don't know what the key to New York City gets you, but he seems to have been courted by politicians, by royals, by other celebrities. Meanwhile, everyone around him, were, were they were aware of these rumours and thought nothing of it. Yeah, well, I guess it's the case where it's, you know, innocent until, until proven guilty. And while the, there were rumours for, for lots of years about some of this behaviour, they were just rumours. And until last last year, November, this is when things really sort of came to the forefront. There's a situation with, with legal situations, with victims being able to come forward and make claims. Now, there was a deadline for this, which was slightly extended after sort of a 10-year window. And this is when he did his ex-girlfriend, Cassie. She's a music artist that he dated for 10 years. She filed a lawsuit against him claiming some absolutely horrific abuse, sex trafficking and lots of claims. And it was a groundbreaking case in that P. Diddy's team settled this case within 24 hours. It was settled out of court uh, and it didn't go any further. Now, that's not obviously, um, he, he said that that didn't show any sort of guilt um, or acknowledgement of, of what kind of she was accusing him of. But then what's happened is three additional legal cases have come forward from different women. And this is where it's, it's sort of gaining more and more traction. Whereas, you know, this time last year, there were just rumours that didn't really have, you know, there was one of his um, ex-girlfriends who appeared on a YouTube show making accusations, but this sort of died down. It didn't gain any any sort of mainstream media coverage. And now this is what the problem is, is that I think when one person feels brave enough to step out, then other people come forward. But we've seen in different cases with the Kevin Spacey situation, that famous legal case, there were multiple allegations against him. People kept coming forward and actually he was found not guilty. So we have to be very careful not to speculate. But at the moment, the, the details of all of this are incredibly distressing and murky. We've got people like Justin Bieber, huge, huge teen star that knew P. Diddy, P. Diddy when he was 16. Now, journalists are going trawling through old footage to find what was being said and, and what the interactions were. Um, and there's sort of an awkward interaction between Justin Bieber and P. Diddy saying, you know, why don't we hang out like we used to when a 16 year old Justin Bieber looks very uncomfortable with that. Usher, who lived with P. Diddy when he was just 13, has said it was pretty crazy and talked about some of the sex that was going on in the house while he was there. So really, I think people have known, but perhaps there's been some blind eyes being turned or people don't really take it seriously until multiple lawsuits start surfacing. It is a little bit strange, I'll say. I'm sure our viewers would agree. Uh, a man who was in his 40s having a 13-year-old boy like Usher stay around his, his place for a few nights and be engaging in sex acts with other women and stuff in front of Usher. That's a little bit strange. I'm not saying that he's guilty, but that's strange behaviour. Uh, Becca, very, very quickly, if you can, uh, is this the start of the Me Too movement for the hip-hop industry then? I think so. I think this is just going to gain traction. I think music hasn't really had its Me Too movement yet. And I think it's going to filter through and, you know, people are much braver at speaking out now, whether the, <clears> you know, the stories believed or not and people will deny them. But I think, yes, this is very much hip hop's Me Too okay. moment. Rebecca Toomey, thank you very much. Coming up after the break, we'll have all the very latest from Angela Rayner's ongoing council house round. So do not go anywhere. But with talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Welcome back to the show. I'm JJ Nisiobi, standing in for Vanessa Feltz, and here's what's coming up this hour. Breaking news this afternoon, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson has been charged with historical sexual offences and has quit as the leader of the DUP. We'll have the latest. Plus, Angela Rayner's council house row, police confirm they're reviewing allegations that Labour's deputy leader broke the law over the sale of her old property as she refuses to publish her tax affairs. And are you heading to the Euros this summer? If you are, you might want to go easy on the pints because the Foreign Office is warning that beer is much stronger in Germany than it is here in the UK. But first, let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. More questions have been raised over the Prime Minister's Easter honours list. Rishi Sunak faced criticism today for giving a major Tory donor a knighthood. Mohammed Mansour gave £5 million last year, which is one of the biggest donations to the Conservatives in decades. But political commentator Mike Buckley told Talk TV it's also the strange timing that's got people talking. They normally happen at the King's birthday, which is in June, or the official birthday, or at New Year. So this is an odd time to be putting out uh, a list of new appointments. So that is raising speculation that Rishi Sunak is planning to go for a summer election. I, I doubt very much that's the reason. I suspect he simply wants to do something to shore up his position in the Conservative Party and making four MPs, you know, giving them um, an honour is a good thing. And it may be this person who's given him five million last year. It may be uh, an attempt to get him to give the Conservative Party more money. Meanwhile, pressure is uh, mounting on Labour's Angela Rayner in the ongoing tax row over the sale of her council house. The deputy Labour leader says she's confident she hasn't broken any rules. Party chair Annalise Dodds agrees. I've got complete confidence in her. And, you know, really, I think we need to ask the question, why are we seeing this petty politicking coming from the Conservatives? You know, I know that rather than talking about the finances of one individual, many people watching this will be saying, well, hang on, why aren't politicians talking about family finances? The leader of the DUP has quit over historic sexual offence allegations. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson wrote to the party chairman, stepping down with immediate effect. All his social media accounts have been deleted. He'll appear in court next month alongside a woman who has also been charged with aiding and abetting in connection with the alleged offences. Pending the outcome of the judicial process, Donaldson has also been suspended from the party in accordance with party rules. Gavin Robinson has been appointed as the interim party leader. Actor Sally Phillips has spoken out after her son with Down syndrome was excluded from playing at a trampoline park. The Miranda and Bridget Jones star says she wasn't allowed in with Ollie, who's 19, unless she had a letter from his GP. Phillips says people like her son are being singled out for being different and that was upsetting and unbearable. The company said it was deeply sorry but that it was following the safety guidance from British Gymnastics. 
Motorists have been warned to avoid using the motorway between 11 and 2 tomorrow and Sunday. That's when traffic will be the heaviest. More than 14 million trips are expected to take place this bank holiday weekend. At least three major airports say they're expecting this to be their busiest Easter weekend on record. Well, Heathrow can expect some serious disruption in two weeks' time with border force workers announcing they're going on strike. 600 officials responsible for carrying out immigration controls and passport checks will walk off the job from the 11th of April. They're angry about a new roster, which they say could lead to the loss of hundreds of jobs. We're not expecting to see Kate Middleton this Easter while she's being treated for cancer. But King Charles is expected to make an appearance at Windsor Castle's Easter Sunday service. Royal commentator Michael Cole told Talk Today it's hugely important to him. It means a lot to him. He is a man of faith. Um, and Easter is arguably a more significant, a more important date in the Christian calendar, even than Christmas. Uh, and he's determined to be there and the Queen will be there with him. And finally, British soldiers might soon be seen with full facial hair. The army has lifted a ban on serving soldiers having beards after years of discussion around its facial hair policy. However, the beards and moustaches must be well-groomed and neat and they will be routinely checked. Former army officer Stuart Crawford told Talk TV it's just a matter of the military catching up with the times. So it's a, it's a sort of military fashion trend, and it just so happens that the, the military and the armed services tend to be about 20 years behind uh, the rest of society when it comes to such trends. And so with 52% or whatever it is of the male population in the UK now sporting facial hair, the army is just catching up. That's your news now. Here's your weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And after all the bad weather we've had recently, a lot of rain, it does look a little more optimistic for Saturday and Easter day. Thankfully, more of us getting away with dry and sunny weather. Quite a complicated picture here. Lots of shower activity, low pressure to the northwest, fronts to the south and east of us. But it does look as though the showers will gradually fade for many inland areas as we head through uh, tonight. Still some for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but many other areas becoming dry. It could turn a little misty with some fog first thing tomorrow morning. And I wouldn't be surprised under those clearest skies we see a little bit of frost in the countryside as well temperatures particularly say through the midlands down to about three to five degrees now as we head through uh, saturday it starts off quite uh, promising with some sunshine but there will be some showers brewing up especially in scotland and in the afternoon i wouldn't be surprised to see some lively showers in northern ireland as well where it'll be quite breezy for many parts of england and wales though it should be dry and quite warm in the sunshine too 13 to 15 degrees we are keeping an eye on some cloud for eastern areas though just from that little weather system here and some showers to well pep up later in the day across the far southwest of England where it's been so wet recently and there'll be more showers on Easter day in the southwest otherwise though not a bad Easter day at all. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thanks to Nadira and Isabel there. Let's move on to our top story. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson has stepped down as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party with immediate effect after he was charged with historical sexual offences. A 57-year-old woman has also been charged with aiding in connection with the alleged offences. Talk TV's chief political commentator, Peter Cardwell, joins me now. Peter, what is the latest on this story there? Well, there's been a huge amount of reaction, not just in Northern Ireland, but also in Westminster to this very shocking news that Sir Geoffrey Donaldson has been arrested and charged with historic offences, including rape, and a 57-year-old woman has been charged with ailing and abetting that as well. So uh, he has resigned as the leader of the DUP. He is still an MP, and there'll be a question about whether there is a by-election in his Lagan Valley constituency. He was not just the leader of the largest unionist party, but of unionism itself, and there had been very difficult political circumstances recently. The DUP had refused to accept the Windsor framework, the sort of last bit of Brexit, or one of the last bits of Brexit, and had gone into 
government with Sinn Féin only in the last few weeks. Now, Geoffrey Donaldson wasn't part of that mandatory coalition, various parties, four parties, together in Northern Ireland. He remained as an MP in Westminster, but his party had gone in in Belfast, and that had been a very difficult decision for them, which had taken many, many months. So it'll be very interesting to see who the next leader of the DUP is. Probably Gavin Robinson, who's another MP. He is the deputy leader and interim leader now as well. But there will be an, uh, some sort of contest to see who the next leader of the DUP is. We've seen the First Minister of Northern Ireland, Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill, and the Alliance Party uh, responding to this, saying it's an ongoing uh, criminal matter and justice must, must serve its course, of course, because Mr Donaldson is charged with these crimes, there's very little that can actually be said about the uh, alleged offences. But certainly, uh, from a political perspective, Northern Ireland is in real crisis, JJ. So, I know, of course, we know Donaldson is a, a big deal in politics, especially over there. But for some of our viewers who aren't perhaps as attuned to the political spectrum as we are, what, what, what is he known for? What, what have been his, his big successes in politics? Well, he's been a huge figure in unionism in Northern Ireland for over 40 years. He was actually the campaign agent for Enoch Powell in the 1980s when Enoch Powell ended his career as a unionist politician. And Geoffrey Donaldson negotiated a lot of the Belfast Agreement as part of his previous party, the Ulster Unionist Party under David Trimble, but walked out of those uh, negotiations on Good Friday, actually it, exactly 26 years ago. Uh, he then opposed that. He left the Ulster Unionists under uh, after a very, very fractious sort of five years, left in 2003, was an independent for a short time, and then became a member and then later leader of the DUP. So certainly a triumph for him to become leader of the DUP. He's been the longest serving MP in Northern Ireland, although will almost certainly stand down either in a by-election or uh, waiting until the next election. That'll be a matter of uh, dispute, I'm sure, in Northern Ireland for some time. And his seat, actually, Lagan Valley, has been a very, very strong unionist seat just outside Belfast. But uh, in the 2019 general election, cut down to a 6,500 majority from a very, very big majority, about 19,000. So it looks as if the centrist alliance party will be gunning for that seat and perhaps even take it. But Geoffrey Donaldson was certainly seen as a key ally, reluctant ally, perhaps, of Rishi Sunak when it went through the Northern Ireland Protocol, the Windsor framework as well, and he was under a lot of criticism when it came to going back into government with Sinn Féin. So certainly uh, things were pretty stable in Northern Ireland after that period of going back into government. Sinn Féin and the DUP seemed to be getting on quite well. We'll see if that uh, relationship becomes more fractious as time goes on. It's certainly a massive political earthquake uh, that has happened within the last 24 hours. So of course it's an active case. We can't talk about it too much, can't, can't, certainly can't speculate, but is his political career essentially over now? For, for Donaldson, even if he was found not guilty, is there a, the, the mud sticks. Can he ever make a return to politics after this? I think it's unlikely he would return to politics after this. He is suspended by his own party. He is no longer the leader of it. He is still an MP. Uh, he's been suspended by the Orange Order as well, the Protestant Order, that March every 12th of July. He's been a member of that for most of his life. Uh, they have suspended him as well because the judicial process has to happen. Certainly, it would be uh, very, very difficult, I think, for Geoffrey Donaldson to make a return to politics. It'll be very interesting to see what happens, whether there's a by-election. We know, of course, there'll be a general election in a few months' time, so there will be calls, certainly, especially from the centrist alliance party that I mentioned, for there to be a by-election, and that would be very, very politically dangerous for the DUP because uh, they've held that seat for a very, very long time. Uh, it's been a unionist seat for even longer, but it could well go to the centrist alliance party. So that'll be very interesting to see. But certainly, I think it is unlikely that uh, Geoffrey Donaldson ever returns to politics, even if these charges are, are actually contested and, and uh, he wins the case. I think that would be unlikely, but we'll see. OK, well, Peter Cardwell, thank you for that wealth of knowledge. Peter Cardwell there, Talk TV's chief political commentator. Moving on now, the row over Angela Rayner's tax affairs has intensified after police and council officials confirmed they are reviewing claims that she broke the law. While the deputy Labour leader is adamant that, she, that the sale of her old council house was done by the book, she's refusing to share the tax advice that she insists proves she did nothing wrong. Keir Starmer says he backs her decision to keep it private and still has full confidence in his deputy. Joining me in the studio now is former Labour advisor Stella Charkidou. And down the line, political commentator, Mike Indian. Uh, Mike, I'll start with you, because I'll be honest, this story, I'm very confused about it. What exactly is it that she's being accused of? 
So this relates to historic tax affairs from Angela Rayner. So she purchased a council house with her husband, who she's now separated from, Mark Rayner. Um, it was some it, for the first five years of their marriage. They separated in 2020. They lived apart. Uh, Ms. Rayner sold the property and at the time claimed it as her main residence. However, there's some um, dispute about whether or not she was actually resident of the property or she was actually because details around the registration of birth of her children list different addresses. So if she wasn't, if it wasn't her primary residence, she would have been liable for a considerable uh, corporate, uh, considerable capital gains tax bill. So uh, the allegations have been made by the Conservative MP for Bury North, James Daly. Ms. Rayner has said repeatedly she's done nothing wrong, but also ruled out publishing the tax advice she received at the time. Interestingly, making it into a political point today as well, saying that she'd only do so if senior Conservative ministers did the same. Stella, you are shaking your head, throwing your hands up. What's, what's wrong? Oh, basically, <laughs> what's wrong? The real story here is James Daly, the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, is wasting the, the precious time of our police officers. Because what's going on here, JJ, is we already know here that the, the tax authorities she had no problem whatsoever beforehand. It's literally just because James Daly, a Conservative Party politician, has decided to write to the police that this is investigated. It's not like they had any concerns about it, that they're looking into this. Mm -hmm. And we are talking about... Uh, Max just said a considerable amount. The amount of money we're talking about is 1,500 quid. That's how much we're talking about. Now, okay. at the same time, Rishi Sunak's wife, while she was a non-dom, she, she could be liable for hundreds uh, of millions, uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of thousands of pounds if she was actually paying the tax that she should be paying where she actually, you know, registered to pay tax here in the UK. Uh -huh. So I find it insane. What is happening here is the Conservative Party is grasping for, for, for one last chance to take down an incredibly powerful woman powerful woman. You know what's my problem? They always say, what's so wrong with uh, wealth? What's so wrong with making money? Well, they're only on okay with earning money, with having money, when it's about multimillionaires like Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak. When a working class woman mm -hmm. like Angela Rayner rises from a working class single mother from a council estate who had her first child when she was 16 years old and literally pulled herself by her own bootstraps. Yeah. Yeah. And then sells her first home because she's getting married and she's going to move with her husband. Everyone is out to get here for 1,500 quid. And you know what's the story here? You know why they're hunting here for this? Because literally all she said was, look, I had a premature child. I had a premature birth. Her, her child came out when, she, when it was 23 weeks old. So for these reasons, we decided that it was best that I, I stayed living in my, in my, in my first home, uh -huh. which was closer to my relatives to help me with taking care of my kid. At the same time, she had an older child, obviously, yeah. right? So she had two kids. Imagine that, which is a perfectly practical situation where everyone would sympathize. Yeah, but Stella, yeah. listen, it's a very impassioned defense of, of, uh, of, your, of your labor mate. <laughs> but if she didn't, if she nothing to hide, why not show the tax the tax advice? Because let me tell you, when Donald Trump was saying, I'm not going to share my, my, my tax details, everyone was saying, well, he's something to hide. Is show us your tax, show us your tax. Is it the show same, it the same situation? If she, has, sorry, evidence, if she has evidence, why not show us the evidence? Where does it stop? Where does it stop? Because you know what? If she shows it, then it looks like there is a story and already it's been talked about long, as if we don't have problems, as if there aren't other politicians that we should be investigating into. And we're looking at Angela Rayner. The only reason why they're looking at Angela Rayner is because they're so bloody threatened from a woman who is doing <laughs> so well. Mark, Mark, I'm coming back to you. Um, as I said to Stella, if uh, Miss Rayner has evidence, why not just present it? Then the story goes away. Here, here's my tax tax advice. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all done. If it was as simple as that, I think it, we, you know, if the media operated that way, then everyone would do it. But unfortunately, this is going to keep going. She's already committed to publishing her tax return if she becomes Prime Minister. There are already serious questions around funding in politics anyway. See the knighthood for the Conservative donor that gave £5 million to the party quite recently. I'm still thinking with a lot of what Stella has to say there as well. What's interesting for me is, is that Keir Starmer has given her this unequivocal backing. He's normally very cautious, but also very ruthless here. But also, to a certain extent, his hands are slightly tied when it comes to Angela Rayner because she's the only member of the Shadow Cabinet 
whom he cannot sack because she's elected by the members. It's traditional the Labour deputy leader has a role in the shadow cabinet. So to have that outside the tent would be difficult. So he's expended this political capital. If there is more to this story, and I say if, because there's no evidence to suggest there is. Mark, let me stop you right there. There is no case. There is no case to answer. It's it's not like there is anything to discipline (laughs) Angela Rayner over. Like literally everyone in the Labour Party, Keir Starman included, is just thinking, okay, what else are they going to find to attack us? They are that desperate. There is no case here about Angela Rayner being in trouble with anyone but a select few people in the media who are really have decided that this is the only way to get to here. And they have been comping through every single... Like, you, you, can, you can tell the Labour Party is doing really, really well when this is literally the worst they can find. Well, it looks... Listen, speaking impartially, it does look a bit questionable, right? Because Labour is supposed to be the party that are for the working class. And if, if what we've actually got is a party that, say they're for the working class, but then a Doing their little How side deals. Working class? It was just her council home, which she, she, she bought through right to buy, yeah. uh, Margaret Thatcher policy. Yes. And, and she, she, she sold it after she got married with her husband, five years after she gave birth to her premature son, because for the very simple reason. Yeah, reasons, you've explained this part already, but huh? you've, you've explained that part. But why not, if she's saying there's no wrongdoing and she says, I've got proof of it, why not just give the proof? Why would why why do women have to literally bear everything, bear all of their personal information in public when the the, the when the conservative men who are ruling us are not doing half the bearing and they already have a lot to answer for from I'm sorry, but there is all of this dirty money in the Conservative Party. I really don't have time to discuss fifteen hundred quid that is that is that is that is not even owed. The tax authorities are not even saying that Angela Rayner, the only person who is saying that there is a case to answer for is Surprise, surprise, the Conservative Party deputy chairman. So, Mike, is, is Stella right? Is this just the Tories playing dirty games and wasting everyone's time? Well, look, obviously they're sc- making political points out of it, and the allegations centre on an, an unauthorised biography of uh, Ms Rayner written by the former Conservative Vice Chair Lord Ashcroft. And, you know, these books have a tendency to make claims that maybe not, aren't necessarily the most um, meticulously researched, we shall say. But it is an interesting point. I think it's it's a sign, actually, of how the election campaign is going to get personal, very nasty, very quickly. It's funny, they tried this with Keir Starmer in the, the, the field which he bought for his mum with the donkeys, which is still my favourite <laughs> story that they tried to make. But look, is there gonna, are the Tories going to try and make political hay out of this? Absolutely. The biggest risk is if there is something that Ms. Reno is holding back, and I stress if because we don't know, there probably isn't. But if there is, then the Tories could claim a high-profile political scalp. If not, then Keir Starmer and Ms. Renner have nothing to worry about. So it's great Man- Greater Manchester Police are reassessing their decision to not investigate. But even if they, if they, whatever they find, there's nothing they can really do about it. It has to still go to HM Revenue and Customs. And the only reason they're the doing police. that is because James Daly, the Conservative Party deputy chairman, wrote to them and said, Can you please look into this? They had no other reason to look into this. They weren't going to, literally, this is a, a Conservative Party politician wasting precious police time. So it's, it's wasting police time. So you think James Daly should be, um, should be punished? For wasting police I time think as well. he should be shamed. I definitely think he should be criticised and shamed and, and find something better. <laughs> I, I would suggest that he goes and canvasses at the constituencies of some of his uh, Conservative uh, Party peers who are about to lose their seats in the next election. <laughs> this I would worry more about my own party rather than trying to literally discredit an incredibly hard-working and talented working-class woman who has built herself up. Well, you said he should be shamed, and I think you have pretty much shamed him, Stella. So (laughs) thank you, Stella Santa Kedu, and thank you, Mike Indian. Coming up after the break, shoppers are being warned against taking up Timu's too-good-to-be-true offer of £50 cash. You're with Talk on TV, radio online, and on your smart speaker. Thank you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. 
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Chinese online megastore Timu is offering users free money in exchange for new signups, but there are concerns that it's a ploy to harvest people's personal information. The promotion offers a combination of cash and store credit of up to £100. All of that in exchange for getting new members to sign up. However, some savvy shoppers spotted that language in the T's and C's, that's terms and conditions, mean that Timu could use people's data to create deep fake clones of them without their permission if they take the money. Joining us now is global futurist Rohit Talwa. Rohit, is there is there a concern here? Like we give our data to people all the time, and, and we don't we don't kick up a fuss. Why is it a problem now? Well, I think partly because it's a Chinese company, it's caused more concern, but also people beginning to realise more and more just how much data we've given away, and we've given it away for free without almost realising it to social media to uh, search engines, to all sorts of apps, because we've got services back, so we're not paying for them other than with our data. Now we're starting to see this trend that's sort of come up in China where you're actually getting hard cash. And then we're beginning to start to look at, well, okay, how much data are they taking? And that's quite scary when you realize just how much information they took the right to uh, collect and that's a concern because we don't know how they're going to use it, although we've got a sense that they're using it to do micro-targeting, really personalised ads. You'll see them on your social media feeds. But also they're giving that information to the manufacturers to help them produce products uh, and that they can then come back and say, well, let's test this particular product and see if it works in the market. Uh, yeah, but why the, is that a problem? Like, why, why, why should we care about that? That's good. I want targeted ads. I want products that are made specifically for me. That's a good thing, isn't it? Absolutely. That side of it is great. And we don't want waste. So we don't want lots of products being produced that no one buys. There are concerns that the manufacturers they're going to are using child labour and prison labour and people who are in forced labour. 
um, but no one can prove that. But the other side of it is just how much data they're collecting and how they're going to use it. And with AI, uh, we know that all sorts of things are possible. If they if they capture your voice, then they can clone your voice. And who knows how they might use that. Maybe in future, one of your friends will get a phone call that feels like it's from you or a personalized ad that feels like it's from you, but it's not. Uh, and that's the concern. And they also want to... Uh, have the ability to capture your image. So you don't know what they might do with that. You might not only send a personalized ad, but it could be a video ad or a video message that's sent to your friends, uh, 10,000 of them in parallel, and they'll all think it's you. So those are the kind of concerns that if they're gathering that much data, we just don't know how they're going to use it. Rohit, isn't uh, this, Rohit, isn't this more... Same concerns about everyone. Though. Rohit, isn't this more an issue uh, that the West just don't like China? Isn't that the thing here? Because you talk about child labour, which we can't prove. Well, Apple have been accused of child labour. Ap Apple are making their products in China. Apple are going to uh, mines in Africa and kids are being put in into those mines. We give our data freely to Meta, Instagram, Facebook. We give it to X. We give our data away all the time. Pe then these, this company are not hiding what they're doing. If, if I give my data to, to X, I get no money. If I give my data to Timu, up to 100 quid. I'm, I'm quids in, this is perfect. Uh, at this time of everyone needing more, we should be encouraging people surely to say, okay, yeah, they might use your voice, they might use your, your image, but it's all written there in the terms and conditions. If you're okay with that, sign away, here's some cash. I don't see why this is seen as a, as a bad thing that they're being honest and actually paying us because Google ain't, aren't paying me, Twitter aren't paying me. Well, exactly. There is a big chunk of that, isn't there? That if Google gave you 50 pounds or 100 pounds or Amazon did, most people wouldn't complain. There would be a few keyboard warriors who went in there and checked out the data and might uh, complain. But it, there is a big thing about it being a Chinese company, and there's a lot in the media, isn't there, right now, about China and its threat to the West. There's also just a kind of sheer concern around the economics of this. Their owner, PDD, uh, is I think 83rd in the world in terms of its valuation. It's worth more than Nike um, and HSBC. So people are just worried about the extent to which Chinese companies are going to dominate. Yeah. And this concern that the Chinese government might have access to that data, which I think is reasonably legitimate. But I, I think they're being put under more scrutiny than, as you say, all of the social platforms, the Googles, the Amazons, the Ebays of this world. Yeah. Um, the only issue I have with it, with this whole Timu thing, is that they are targeting, I feel, younger people. So kids who are on, on these uh, social media apps and are seeing, oh, I'm, I'm 15 years old and I can, I can get 50 quid if I sign up to this. I, I feel that, that, that morally that is a bit questionable because older persons like yourself and I, we're a bit more switched on, we're a bit more alert to data. So. If, if you can just be quick with this one, this answer, what data should we absolutely not give to people, do you think? Personally, I don't think we should be giving very much at all, um, particularly with children. I don't know why they need it. They just need to know that we bought something. Otherwise, they don't need our data if they're giving us free services. Uh, and so I think there should be a kind of much more stringent restriction on what data anyone gives. And particularly if someone is under 18, then we should have them really explain why they need any more data than your credit card and, and a one-off name that you use that could change every time. So they could target ads for us better, Rohit, that's why. I'm okay with it. Anyway, Rohit, thank you for your time. Coming up after the break, are you heading to the Euros this summer? If so, you might want to keep count of the number of pints you drink. I'll tell you why after the break. You'll talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, Trico. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Now, in a couple of months, thousands of British football fans will flock to Germany, hoping to see England or Scotland bring back the European Championship trophy. The crowds will be singing, the drinks will be flowing, England will probably be losing, but fans have been warned not to have too many steins, as German beer is often stronger than pints here at home. The Foreign Office issued official advice telling supporters to expect a stronger kick in their pre-match lager and urge them to drink responsibly. It's never going to work. Joining me in the studio now is A.D. Smith, a drinks expert and presenter of The Three Drinkers, and also Marco Helliwell, an England fan. Marco, I feel like we just found you on the street because it just says you're an England fan. Well, where were you? Uh, well, actually, I'm from the half-timers uh, band <laughs> that uh, was previously 33-1 uh, in the last World Cup uh, with Coming Home for Christmas. Yes. Um, so uh, we're releasing another song as well um, for the Euros. Um, so, yeah, we, we specialise in uh, England tournament songs. And do you get on the lagers when you're, when you're at the games? I'm an Englishman, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, that's a silly question, really. And um, have you been to Germany before? You drank over there? I have, yeah. I've been to, I'm a big Arsenal fan. I went to uh, Bayern Munich away. I knew Munich there was away. something wrong with you. Yeah. I knew it. I knew <laughs> I could tell when you walked in. I thought, uh, something wrong with this guy. Sure. You're an Arsenal fan. I should have asked before going on air. You but, sure? <laughs> uh, yeah, so in the Champions League last time round, uh, I went to Bayern Munich away. I've spent a good amount of time in the beer halls in Munich. And, and is, uh, is it stronger? You find it a bigger kick? I mean, uh, I mean, I'm there for like a football game. I'm, I'm sort of drinking excessively anyway. But <laughs> if you, uh, you know, if you get enough breakfast down you and uh, you know, sort of level it out with a bit of water as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, you know, we're sort of seasoned drinkers here. We, I think we can handle it. Yeah, AD, yeah, you, you are the most seasoned of all drinkers. Look at your face. You've had a hard <laughs> life. But... <laughs> Is it, how much stronger is German beer than, than our English stuff? So it's it's a good amount stronger. If we look at our British beers and our British ciders, I mean, our British beer is coming at about 4.4% alcohol. But uh -huh. if we go over to the German beer, it's anywhere between about 4.5 to 5.2. So it's, it's much stronger on the ratio spectrum. Now, I've got a couple of facts here. So English beers, right? If right. we look at an, a light lager or an English dark ale, 4% ABV. 
goes up a bit, English bitter 4.2%, and then English pale ale 4.7%. Now, if we compare that with the German beers, we've got the Munich Lager, the German Pilsner, and the Hefeweizen starting at 5%. Okay. And then it goes up from there. Schwartz beer, 5.2. Dunkelweizen, 4. Oh, sorry, 5.4. Oktoberfest, which everyone seems to be obsessed with because of mm -hmm. just the name, comes in at 5.6. Then Weissenstock, wait for it, 7.6% ABV. Ooh. That's going to get you merry a lot more than our British beer. Now, do British people drink British beer much? All That's I think what of I was is going to say. All I have <laughs> is Cronenberg, uh, Carlsberg, Peronis. Other mm. beers are available. But, but I feel like we don't really drink English beer anymore, do we? Yeah, I just feel like we're imported sort of all the worst beers from all the other countries, really, <laughs> and, we, and we lap it up, really, if I'm being honest. I mean, one point I would like to make, I mean, tell me, you're the expert, but there's less chemicals in German beer, right? Is that the, the way it's brewed? Oh, it's pure. There's like laws there, right? I mean, that there is, to be honest, across the board in England and Germany, it has to be made to a certain kind of quality basis. I would say that possibly because of some of the production methods they use, it could be a little bit more natural, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't go as far as saying that there's not loads of like chemicals. It, beer shouldn't have chemicals in any way, otherwise we shouldn't be allowed to consume it. Um, but as a nation, like, regardless of football, football aside, we are known for consuming more alcohol. I mean, yeah. the typical gin and tonic pour that someone does at home is three times the amount that you're meant to have in a gin and tonic. Well, all that means is that our, public, our publicans are not serving us proper, proper measures. They're doing these little <laughs> tiny ones. Um, I've got to be honest, boys. I don't like beer. I hate it. I know I want to be a lad, I want to be part of the gang, but I hate beer. And I stay trim by not drinking it. I prefer a nice rosé. That's, that's me. I will, and I will go to, to watch England and I'll be the, the idiot with a glass of rosé sipping like that. Yeah, I'm I, sorry. I love rosé. That's it. I love you for that. And this is one thing, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, men don't drink rosé. Now, ab absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. As soon as the not. sun is out, <laughs> right I'm there with a glass of rosé. And this is the thing. Over the past five years, there have been more men year on year consuming beautiful rosé from all across the world. Um, that was a seamless link because I, I actually have some say. facts as well about Yeah, about well, I rose. think we've got some glasses on the table. <laughs> we've got some glasses on the table. So allow me to tell you this as well. So there's 3.3 .3 to 3.5 units on average per beer in Germany. Uh -huh. Whereas if you have a rosé, it's only 2.1 units. And what? There's, yeah, so th there's a couple of little tricks as well to not getting drunk because we should drink to have things Thank that you. we enjoy. We shouldn't drink just to get drunk. No, that's, of course. That's not what it's like. I never drink just to get drunk. Never. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of my favorite rosés. Um, as you know, I also write a column on The Independent all about drinks. And this is one of my top choices for rosé with the best personality this is of delicious. 2024. So this is Minuti from Provence. Have a little smell. And you know what? Lads, drink rosé. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's yeah. a beautiful, fruit-forward, gorgeous wine that'll keep you refreshed in the sunshine, less units in it. The trick is, pour a little bit less into your wine glass. When you've got a beer cup or a beer glass, yeah. the lads usually always get a pint, right? You're not yeah. going to get someone going and saying, oh, I'll have a half pint, because all their mates are going to mock them. Mm -hmm. First of all, never feel bad about having a half pint. That is totally fine. But if you're going to go on the rosé, you can have a wine glass and pour a little bit less in, and then just keep having a bit of water. In between every glass of rosé, have a glass of water. How much is this bottle of rosé going to set me back? So this particular rosé here is about, this one's £19, which is a little bit more on the premium side. I don't however. know how much you think I get paid for doing this show, <laughs> mate, but it's not enough. 19 quid for a bottle of wine. Well, you better have a couple more sips. <laughs> <laughs> And where's it available? Everywhere? Not, so you, not down my local Asda, I, I assume. You can get this at Waitrose. You can get it at a lot of the major supermarkets. Um, they've got the Prestige Rosé, and then they've got M by Minuti, which is their kind of more affordable range. But Sounds like a bit of me, that one. <laughs> the <go>. affordable range. <laughs> Marco, quickly, you're wearing the, the, the famous red England football shirt. In the news today, they're saying that our new away kit is outselling the, the home kit because of the nonsense about the flag. It's like, I don't want to get brought into this. No, no, I'm uh, bringing you in. Thing. I'm no, bringing bring, you no, in. Bring me in. I mean, look, what I would say is that, you know, and Nigel Farage absolutely butchered the flag on his, you know, sort of campaigns and made it purple mm. and whatnot. And, you know, we're not sort of talking about that on the uh, British Army um, uh, uniform. The, the, the Union Jack is in khaki. So, yeah. you know, and there's not as much, up, uh, you know, uproar about that. So, um, listen, it's just a, it's a culture war and I just don't want to get involved in it. And what I would say is it's negativity that we don't need before going to, to the Euros 
And, uh, you know, we love being a bit negative before the Euros. We've just got to get behind the team because yeah. it's coming home, guys, right? Yeah. 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 Let's just start singing now. We're we singing. Cheers to England. Toast to England. To England. To England. To England. To England. To England. <laughs> All right, thank you, AD, and thank you, Marco. Coming up after the break, a vlogger has shared her weird things about British culture. Nice and negative, but I'm not sure that I agree with any of this, actually. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minute, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Now, a Canadian living in the UK has shared the things that she thinks are weird about our British culture, and they're things that us Brits don't even seem to think twice about. Take a look at this. Number one, it is totally reasonable to buy a caterpillar cake, and everyone knows who it is. So this little British cork came up around Christmas time. My mom was here for a visit, and I had to explain who Colin the caterpillar is. <laughs> I just think it is so cute and funny and silly that as a population, we all know who the caterpillar is. You don't even have to say it. Or you could just talk about Colin. I'm gonna go out and get a Colin. And everybody knows. <laughs> He's just part of the family, until you eat him, of course. Number two, a weird thing that Brits do that they think is normal is consume some of the most creative sandwiches I've ever seen. Can I interest you in a chip buddy? Yes. That is a sandwich where the inside are chips. <laughs> Just like the name implies.
thing YouTuber Alana mentions is receiving pet names from strangers like Lovely or Sweetheart, which she said she used to find condescending, but now that she's used to it, she thinks that's actually very sweet. Lovely. Now, joining me in the studio is broadcaster Claire Muldoon. Claire, what do you think of this? When I first read the story, I was like, how dare anyone make a mockery of what weird things us Brits do? You know, I was there's, furious. I'll tell you, pet. I'll tell you, darling, <laughs> there's one thing that I, I actually give her credence for, and that's Morris dancing. She can take that one. I'll give her that one. But Colin the Caterpillar, come yeah, on. He's a Even Al, it's a bit of alliteration. <laughs> do Canadians know what that means, I wonder? <laughs> Can they even pronounce a boot? That's how we know they're Canadian and not American. Um, she also said eating creative sandwiches. I think she means stuff like chip butties. Oh, come on. Is that a creative sandwich? She has, she, no one has lived, JJ, unless they've been to Glasgow to have the square slice sausage, the potato scone and the fried egg in one hard Wait, burnt the, roll. The squared sausage? Square slice sausage. You've What's, never had one. No. You've never lived. Do you actually put <laughs> crisps in your sandwiches? Only ready salted crisps. Only ready salted. Why only ready salted? Well, prawn cocktail tastes weird, all, all that oh, butter and white bread. There's some lovely, lovely crisps now you could get <laughs> and put it in your sandwich. Um, but the chip butty, delicious. I actually had a fish finger sandwich today. Aren't they lovely? Delicious. Bit Because it's Good Friday, of course. That's why I'm eating the yep, fish. I'm yep, eating the fish. Yep. Um, she also said uh, that polite gestures to rally the troops are... Leaving the social so, what she, so the other thing that she said was that people in general in this country, when they're ready to leave, say an event or right. a dinner party or whatever, <laughs> she, she announced that we announce it apparently 10 minutes before we go. But in my view, I think that's just manners because half the time, hosts <laughs> might be really relieved that the cohort is leaving their place. Yeah. And the other thing is, well, if you've got like children or extra family members, yeah. you want to give them time, JJ. Get them all ready. You need to let them know, look, yeah. guys, we're on our way. Now, this is a very British thing. Being polite to people that you hate, <laughs> but also being mean to people that you like. I'm not mean to people that I like. You've just described the media, haven't you? <laughs> haven't you, really? <laughs> We're all too frightened and too, you know, to like people that we really don't like. It's like, oh, hello, darling. Hello. Oh, that's lovely perfume you've got on. Oh, God, you're right. I did, I did that to you just now. You did. I did that to you. I hate you. I hate secrets <laughs> out, I'm afraid. Uh, taking your shirt off <clears throat> in the sun. Actually, I, I don't like that. I, there's one thing I hate. Look, it's eight degrees Celsius Daddy. outside. There's no clouds. Daddy. And there's some geezer Daddy. who's got a... Body like to a dad walking you, off with his shirt off. I, well, that's a personal preference. <laughs> um, you know, maybe whatever it looks like with the tap off, as we say in Glasgow. But before iPhones, do you not think that that was the way, that was the weather barometer? That's how we knew if it was going to be hot outside because taps off was trending. Taps off. Tops off. <laughs> the only place I would really think it's absolutely a no-go area yeah. is on the tubes well, or on public transport in general. Yes, of course, on, of course. But I don't even want to see flip-flops uh, on public transport. What? Listen, if you're going to the beach or the pool, fine, wear your flip-flops. Do not have your dirty toes out for everyone to see when oh. you're on the tube. It's disgusting. It's vile. No. Yeah, it's disgusting. Vile. Have there. you written your own list? <laughs> I wish I had them. I wish I, I, wish I had. Um, and yeah, bring in a cake to work on your birthday. Oh, you know, there's some really sad souls it's, out there, It's Gigi. weird, isn't it? You, they really are, and they don't have anyone else to celebrate their birthday with apart from their colleagues. No, that's Seriously. not it. No, I'm going to cut some of this caterpillar cake if you want some. I'm going to cut Colin's backside off if you want a little bit. <laughs> um, I don't. I, I just think it's annoying having to take cake in. I also don't like when people go on holiday and you have to bring back sweets from wherever you've well, been. Well, do you know what I really don't like? People who think they're great bakers baking a cake <laughs> and bringing it in. <laughs> <laughs> I will not eat a cake that's one's face. You know that baked. emoji, the vom face? That, that's, that's what, that's, that's, that's what yeah, it is. That's what home baking is. Would you like some, Colin? I'm fine, thank you. Well, I'm not going to eat it. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. I'll just leave it there. Nice prop. Um, yeah, going on holiday, bringing sweets in uh, and but baking. That's a nice baking. thing to do. Look, if I go to Spain for the weekend, I don't have to be thinking at the airport, let me get a big bag of cheap sweets to take back to the office. No, no, no I'm not doing it. Let me, enjoy my let me enjoy my holiday in peace. But if it's only a weekend, it's not a holiday. What? It's a weekend <laughs> break. We're <laughs> talking about if you go away for a fortnight. No. Or three weeks, I'm yes. Like, no, I'm putting a stop to that. I'm putting what a stop to Scottish it right now. Are you Scottish in disguise? I think I am. Really? Think I'm you're very yeah. tight. Maybe I am. Maybe yeah. a little bit. Maybe a little bit. But no, listen. Um, and if, Also, if you are going to bring a cake into the office, yeah. don't bake it yourself, because I don't trust your hygiene. You know, not you, not you personally, said, that, no, but just people just in general. I think the worst kind is home-baked stuff being brought in. And then, of course, we've got the other issue in this country now. 
with allergies. Where oh. have they sprung from? Everyone's got an allergy these Ev days. Yeah. Everyone's a celiac. So Everyone's got gluten intolerance. Yep. Despicable. Yep. Or peanuts or whatever. It's just, <laughs> it's made up. Speaking of um, celiacs and people with gluten intolerances, I have an intolerance to two women who are now in the studio with us. Oh, the beautiful oh, Kelly Smith and Esther Craigie from The Talk, my lovely colleagues. I'm joking, I love you two. You, you two are my favourite females from The Talk. All oh, right. Well, I'm, my I'll, 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 I'll let the other females know. Yeah. <laughs> please, please. I was going to say, girls, I was... in mind, he did say, we've got to be mean to those we don't like. True. I'm <laughs> no, sorry, nice no, to people we, we, don't we don't like, like yeah. and mean to people we do. Well, yeah. that's, that's actually that's the pretty. British way. Yeah, yeah, that is yeah. the British way. That's yeah. kind of traditional, yeah. isn't it? Though yeah. it's how you know but that you like somebody or that somebody likes you. Is it's yeah. like they slag you off to their face, <laughs> to your <laughs> face. All the virtue of his love for you both. Well, well you point. clearly hate us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What have you got coming up on the talk? So we've, we're talking about uh, the epidemic of shoplifting in Britain. So apparently, shoplifting has got so bad in the UK that pubs are setting up stalls to sell stolen goods that have been stolen by criminal gangs. And uh, shops what? are being forced to replace packs of detergent with dummy boxes. Yeah. That's how bad it's got. I mean, apparently the UK high street has never seen such lawlessness in this uh, in, in, in its history. Well, I'm not, I'm not making light of this. Worse. I'm not no. making light of this, but I did see a seagull the other day uh, fly into a shop and pick up a packet of crisps and fly out. It's I gone mean, viral. <laughs> Viral, I mean, thing. I think seagulls have been doing it for quite a while, but uh, they're, they're, they're proposing all sorts of in, in ingenious plans to stop this, like making yeah. attacking um, people who work in shops a criminal offence to, to stop people from getting a bracelet. Why isn't that... Anyway. Attacking people is a criminal offence. It's, it's, it's a criminal offence. But, 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 yeah. yeah. but you know how you have separate um, legislation for attacking a police officer? It's a different kind of crime. Right. Apparently, those kinds of protections should extend to, to shop workers. OK. But we're just, yeah, we're just going to be talking about the fact that some of just They're going in with bins and yeah. then coming out yeah. and then flogging Brazenly. it. Flogging it a minute later on on various places on the web. Um, we're going to be talking about the England away kit outselling the home strip in a woke flag row. This is, I don't know if you've seen the pictures. I mean, the, do you know what? I don't know anything really about football, but if I saw somebody, <laughs> yeah, but if I saw somebody playing in a kind of blueberry kit, I wouldn't know that they were necessarily Certainly, in yeah, England. English. And I was just told by somebody who is a fan of football that England fans do not appreciate a playful homage, which apparently this is being described mm. as. Yeah, I think that's probably correct. And we've voted with our, with our wallets. Yeah, and we're exactly Nike that. Instead. So this yeah. is a punch yeah. in the nose for Nike and our FA. Yeah, so we are going to be discussing those two things. We're also going to be talking about all sorts of things, yeah. including Angela Rayner. Yeah, which we... we... You have different opinions on. Yeah, we do yeah. indeed. That's going to, yes. Mm, okay. yes we do well, indeed. Show, and I think I'm going to be joining you guys on the show. And too. you'll be there as well. I'll be there. Yeah. Be there. And yeah. Bad news yeah. for anyone who's already sick of you. <laughs> yeah, if, you <laughs> if you're sick of me, it's a little too late. So I'm here for another hour after this. Yeah. Um, guys, dig into the, the Colin Caterpillar. I'll have I'll the tail end. Boys. You have a tail end? Yeah. I love I, the tail I end. I bet you will. Penny Smith, good grief. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. Sadly, we have come to the end of the show, but stay with us because up next, as I said, is the talk. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in and uh, have a happy bank holiday. Good night. today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. 
and yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right yay. too. Quite yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really 